All right, here we go. By the time we finish this section today, we will be able to conduct analysis of variance um, on a data set to test for the equivalence or difference between more than two, two or more population means. Normally, this test is conducted using the calculator because it is a very tedious test, especially to find a test statistic value. Uh, there's a lot of calculations involved that go into computing that very important statistic as you'll find out. I may have you do one problem manually, but it's gonna be a very, very small data set, okay? So we'll see how this goes here. All right, now, <clears throat> the test statistic is distributed according to yet another continuous probability distribution, uh, not the normal distribution, not the chi-square distribution, but it is distributed according to what is called an F distribution, which like the chi-square distribution is a continuous positively skewed probability distribution. Uh, and for that reason, um, when we conduct this test manually, we'll have to find a critical F value, uh, which will separate our rejection from our acceptance region here, okay? Now, the one-way analysis of variance, which we're going to study, is used to test the equality of three or more means using sample variances. It is called the one-way analysis because different populations are distinguished by a single variable, variable called a factor. For example, if you were comparing the average income of people living in different states, the state residence would be the factor. By conducting an F test, which is also called an analysis of variance or one-way analysis of variance test, uh, we can test a hypothesis that all population means are equal using a single test. If we conducted pairwise uh, tests, um, what happens um, for like three population means, we would have to conduct three different hypothesis uh, t-test, hypothesis t-test, um, and six separate tests for four population means, 10 tests for five populations, and so forth. Um, and the problem with doing these pairwise uh, t-tests is that uh, not only does it, you know, consume more time, but it also increases the chance of committing a type 1 error. Uh, that's an inevitable uh, consequence of conducting uh, more and more t-tests. The type 1 error risk increases. All right. Now, suppose that we do a 10 t-test at 5%, the probability of avoiding a type 1 error at 1 t-test is 0.95. So the probability of avoiding a type 1 error on all 10 tests drops significantly all the way down to about 60% chance. In other words, there's a 40% chance of committing a type 1 error if you decide to reject the null hypothesis. To get around this major difficulty, analysis of variance is necessary. All right, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be comparing essentially variances uh, between um, uh, variances between uh, groups or factors uh, versus the amount of variation or variance that exists within groups or factors. <clears throat> and the between group variance, uh, this is the variance of the means of, of all the populations. Um, can be computed by using this uh, formula down below. Notice we have a grand mean uh, of all the datas that cut across all the different populations or samples. And then we can compute what's called the, uh, the amount of variance that exists between the different populations or the different samples. And this would be the formula that you'd want to use here. Okay, where we have K groups, um, N is the size of the ith sample. Uh, so all these samples from the different populations may or may not, you know, be the same. Sample sizes do not necessarily have to be the same. And X sub I bar is the mean of the ith sample. The numerator of this expression is called the sum of squares 
uh, error between um, um, different factors or, cat or, or categories that are being tested. So we call this the sometimes the SSB, the sum of squared error between treatment levels. Right? Sometimes we call our factors treatment levels also. Then we have a sum of squared errors between or within uh, treatment levels. This is represented by the within group variance. And there is the formula for computing the within group variance here. The numerator of this expression is called the sum, often called the sum of squared errors within. Um, okay, uh, within the uh, the various uh, groups or categories, and or it's more often referred to as a sum of squared uh, for the error SSE value. All right, but your author is doing uh, coining a little bit differently in this textbook as opposed to most textbooks I've seen. Anyways, the idea behind this is to generate an, uh, a test statistic, which is distributed according to this F um, continuous probability distribution. And it is the ratio of the amount of variance that exists between treatment levels or factors divided by the amount of variance that exists within um, each factor or treatment level. And the idea behind this is if the numerator uh, gets large. That means you have a large variance between treatment levels, a large difference, if you will. And that would tend to push this test statistic up into the upper tail rejection region of the F distribution, in which case we would be inclined to reject the null hypothesis and say that not all the population means are equivalent to each other. Now, in order to um, find a critical F value from this uh, distribution. Uh, we have uh, K minus one degrees of freedom for the numerator and N minus K degrees of freedom for the denominator. Now where K is the number of treatment levels or factors and N, uppercase N, is the total size of your entire sample if you were to combine all the treatment level samples. Okay, So we have a numerator, numerator degree of freedom and a denominator degree of freedom here. These would be the hypotheses that we test when we conduct analysis of variance. The null hypothesis says that all population means are equivalent. The alternative hypothesis says at least um, one difference exists between um, to population means. In other words, not all population means are equivalent to each other. So these are the hypotheses we always test when we conduct analysis of variance. All right, in order to uh, facilitate our ability to come up with the test statistic, the F variance ratio, we use this, um, this analysis of variance table here, this ANOVA table. ANOVA is short for analysis of variance. <laughs> and the table here has two rows uh, between groups and within groups. And it has um, one, two, three, four, five columns here. Uh, the source column, the sum of squares column, the degrees of freedom column, and the mean square error column. And then your test statistic is going to be way over here in the upper right of this table, the F variance ratio which again is the ratio of the amount of variance between treatment levels versus within treatment levels. All right, now in order to conduct the this parametric uh, analysis of variance, there are some underlying uh, requirements. As is true with all of our hypothesis tests we conducted in the past, all of the populations must be approximately normally distributed. All of the samples are independent. All of the populations have the same variance, approximately the same variance. And a quick way to check for that is to build a box plot for each, um, each population. And then just compare the variances or the lengths of the boxes. And if the lengths of the boxes are about all the same, we would say that the variances are approximately equivalent to each other. All right. So these are the under... Uh, 
underlying uh, requirements for analysis of variance to be uh, doable. All right, so here, ladies and gentlemen, is a, um, a small data set to illustrate this procedure of conducting analysis of variance. The following table shows the fuel economy for 12 cars in three different categories or three different treatment levels. We have one treatment level, which is small cars. We have another treatment level or factor, that's sedans. And we have a third factor or treatment level, which involves luxury cars. And again, these are the uh, fuel economies in miles per gallon for randomly selected vehicles in each of these uh, factors or treatment uh, levels or categories. We want to test the claim that all three categories of car have the same uh, mean fuel economy. We'll test at 5% level of significance. So the hypotheses are as such. The claim is the null hypothesis, which says that the mean fuel economy of small cars is equivalent to the mean fuel economy of sedans, which is equivalent to the mean fuel economy of luxury vehicles, versus the alternative hypothesis that says, no, this is not true. Um, there is a difference between the fuel economies, uh, the mean fuel economies uh, of these three um, groups here. So those are the hypotheses we're testing. There's our data set. Notice the sample sizes are not the same. They don't necessarily have to be the same. They might, but they, they may not have to be. All right. The bulk of this uh, work with this particular test resides in computing the test statistic, and it's a very tedious thing to do. There are three categories and 12 data values total. So uppercase N is 12. There's 12 observations total. We have three treatment levels because we have three different types of cars, small sedans and luxury. That's why K is equal to three. A numerator degree of freedom would be K minus one or three minus one or two. And a degree, a denominator degree of freedom would be N minus K, which is to say 12 minus three, which is nine. The critical value for a right tailed F test or analysis of variance test with these degrees of freedoms at 5% is 4.26. Now, where are they getting that value there? Well, we have to go in the back of our textbook and consult an F table. So let's see if we can do that. So we'll go in the back of our book, tables, appendix A. And ladies and gentlemen, we're looking for the F distribution right here. So table A-7. <clears throat> this is the F distribution here. Notice. The leftmost column represents the denominator degrees of freedom, while the column headings represent the numerator degrees of freedom. And what was the deal here? How do we compute denominator versus numerator degrees of freedom? Well, the numerator degrees of freedom is k minus 1. The denominator degrees of freedom is always n minus k. And notice we're testing at 5% here. Notice this table is geared for a level of significance of 0 0.005. So this is the wrong table. And so we have to scroll on down to find the correct table. Here alpha is at 0 0.01. Here alpha is at 0 0.025. Finally, here alpha is at 0.05. This is the table we need to use. So how many new uh, denominator degrees of freedom do we have? We got uh, 12 minus three or nine, and we have three minus one or two numerator degrees of freedom. So two numerator degrees of freedom and nine denominator degrees of freedom. Two numerator degrees of freedom nine denominator degrees of freedom, 
Our test statistic is 4.26. That's, excuse me, that's not our test statistic. That's your critical F value. That separates your upper tail rejection region from your lower tail do not reject the null hypothesis region. So like the chi-square distribution, the F distribution is a positively skewed distribution like this. And the rejection region always lies in the upper tail for parametric analysis of variance. So this is your critical chi-square variate right here. All right, which is 4.26. Any questions how we found that value from our uh, F table? So make sure you go to the table that has the correct level of significance that you're testing your hypotheses at. And then you need to know the number of denominator degrees of freedom and the number of numerator degrees of freedom to ultimately find your critical uh, uh, F value. Any questions how we found that here? All right, so 4.26 here. So 4.26 is the critical uh, F value at 5%. Now we have to find the mean uh, economy for small cars, which is 37.25 miles per gallon. For sedans, it's 35.4, and luxury cars is 26 miles per gallon. Now, you're probably wondering, duh, I mean, why not just look at these sample means? Why do we have to bother with all this other crap down here? It, it's obvious the sample means are not equivalent to each other. So why don't we just, you know, then take a leap of faith and say, well, all the population mean fuel economies are not equivalent to each other. Well, the flaw in that, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is just constitutes one sample chosen from respective populations. Who's to say that if I wasn't to reach in and pull out a second sample from each of these popu three populations, who's to say that those sample means would be different? Maybe all of a sudden they're all the same or very close to being the same. And how many pop samples of size, whatever, can you select from these parent populations? There might be hundreds or thousands of them, each with a different sample mean. And so which ones do you go with as being the accurate? means to compare and make a determination. Well, it's anybody's guess. And that's why, okay, you cannot base your conclusion off of just one sample, all right? Be careful of that. That was true when we conducted hypothesis testing for, testing for one population mean. You never wanna just use a sample, one sample result to infer what a population result is because there might be many, 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 many samples you can choose from the parent population each with a different sample mean. So be careful of that. So just because it looks like these sample means are different doesn't mean necessarily that the population sample means, uh, uh, the population means are necessarily different. So we have to conduct formal analysis of variance here. Notice the variance of our first sample is 20.917. For the second sample is 37.3. And for the third sample, it's seven. Now, you can save yourself an immense amount of time if you were to just put like uh, this data, like this data in list one, this data in list two, and this data in list three, and then use your one var stats function to find the mean and the variance for each of these uh, samples here. That would save a lot of time, even if you did this problem manually. All right, now we have to find what's called the, uh, the grand mean which is found by adding all of your observations, all your 12 observations together and dividing by 12, in which case you get 33.667. Now we're ready to compute the variance between uh, treatment levels or groups. And this is the formula we used here. So for treatment level number one, what was the sample size? For the small cars, it was four. And that's why you see four right here times the mean of the first group, the small cars, was 20.917. Wait a minute here. No, 37.25 is the mean. Sorry about that. So we take the mean of the first treatment or factor or small cars, 37.25, subtract off the grand mean, square that result, add it to the second um, group of cars, 
which there were five observations times its mean minus the grand mean squared plus the third group whose mean was 26 and there were three observations. Divide by um, K minus one, three minus one, K is three. There's three groups of cars here, three factor levels we say, or we say there's three treatment levels. And we get 121.359. That is not your test statistic, however. Now we got to find the variance uh, that exists within groups. And to do that, we use this formula here. So notice we're going to need to know the size of our sample for each group and also its variance. And the variances were computed up here. Do we understand how we're getting this second variance here of 25.106? Do we understand how that's coming into existence? Yep. All right. So it's really a matter of using these formulas, but you can see it's somewhat tedious. And, you know, you got to understand that we only had very small sample sizes here. I mean, could you imagine, like, if for each of these treatment levels, if you had, like, 100 observations for each one, how long it would be just to compute these variances between and within the treatment levels. That in of itself would take a long period of time to do. So you can see how tedious this could really get. You, could, you know, could you imagine dealing with samples of size like 10,000 or maybe even a size million? I mean, this is just not happening in a human sense. We're not going to be able to do this. And that's why a computer system is... Uh, very attractive for large sample sizes. Anyways, we have our variances uh, for the amount of variation between treatment levels versus within treatment levels. And it's this ratio, this struggle between these two values that, that is going to determine in what region our test statistic falls. Again, if there's more variance between treatment levels versus amount of variation within treatment levels, that's strong evidence to suggest that we would want to reject the null hypothesis and say, hey, uh, there's a difference between these population means here. Mm. All right, so they take the um, between variance and divide it by the within variance, and they get a test statistic finally of 4.83. Notice 4.83 falls in the upper tail rejection region of the F distribution because it is greater than the critical F value of 4.26 that we determined from that uh, F table in our appendix. Uh, and therefore, Liz Owen, we would conclude that we are able to reject the null hypothesis at 5% level of significance. And therefore we would conclude that at least one of these uh, mean fuel economies is different from uh, at least one of the other ones. So in other words, not all of these mean fuel economies are equivalent to each other here. Okay, and that's what this uh, formal analysis of variance test is telling us here. And uh, notice uh, the table uh, has been filled out here. Let's see here. Sum of squared errors. So this 125.359 and 25.106, those are the values that came from these formulas right here. Okay. Notice your numerator degrees of freedom is right here. This is your denominator degrees of freedom. This is sometimes referred to as your total sum of squared errors. Uh, so... We normally refer to this as like SSB, the sum of squared errors between treatment levels. And this is your like SSE value, the sum of squared errors within your treatment levels. And this is SST here. SST is just the sum of the SSB and SSE values here. If you conduct analysis of variance using a statistical software package, 
it often reports the ANOVA table. So this is your ANOVA table that basically summarizes all of the uh, intermediate calculated results that ultimately um, enable the F test statistic to come into existence, okay? So the most, most important value from this table is the F variance ratio or the F test statistic, 4.83. But it's amazing the amount of work you gotta do to get to that test statistic value. That's what makes that analysis of variance kind of tedious here. <clears throat> All right. Now, all we know, all this test is able to tell us is that there does appear to be a difference between the mean fuel economies of these uh, three categorized vehicles. It does not tell us which vehicle has the superior fuel economy and which one has the most inferior fuel economy. This test is not designed to tell us that. This test just tests for equivalence versus non-equivalence of population means. If you wanted to uh, determine which vehicle has the superior fuel economy, you might want to build what are called Tukey confidence intervals um, or conduct this other test here uh, that I really not I really haven't seen this test in elementary stats books here, but I have in some elementary stats books seen these Tukey confidence intervals, which basically build a confidence interval um, pairing up uh, two of each of these uh, fuel mean fuel economies. And by doing these, by constructing pairwise confidence intervals, you can ultimately ascertain which fuel economy is superior versus inferior. And unfortunately, our calculator cannot compute two key confidence intervals. Um, but computer software packages can, like Minitab, um, Minitab is a popular user-friendly so, uh, stat software program. Um, SAS is used a lot in industry. Um, SysStat is used in several elementary stats courses. Okay, uh, you know, even Excel can do quite a bit of statistical analyses. Your spreadsheet there. And of course, we got our TI-84. Okay. There are other stats programs out there. These are the ones that I kind of remember. I uh, haven't gone through college and used those time to time. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if we can conduct this test, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, using our calculator now. So that is kind of like the critical value method way of testing these hypotheses. And as always, we've been blessed with having a p-value way of doing it also. And nothing changes here. So we're going to run through the calculator way of solving this hypothesis, this analysis of variance problem here. First, we have to put our data in list. So we go to stat, edit. And in list one, I will put the fuel economies for the small vehicles. And in list two, and in list two, I'm going to put the fuel economies for the sedans. And in list three, I'm going to put the luxury vehicle fuel economies. Then when we do this, we get out of this by hitting second mode to quit. Now we go to stat, test, and we scroll down till we run into a wonderful function called the ANOVA function, analysis of variance. Does all of our calculators have that? this available? ANOVA. Yep. I believe all the 84s do have this. Um, even my TI-83, which is a step down dinosaur from this calculator, even has the ANOVA function. Okay. Let's hit enter to activate it. 
Now we have to specify the lists that we wish to conduct ANOVA on. That would be list one. So I hit second one, comma button, which is just above my seven button. List two, which is second, the number two button, comma, and then the list three, second three button, closed parenthesis. We're ready to conduct analysis of variance here. Hit enter, and boom, the test is done. Notice that your test statistic value is 4.83. That's your F variance ratio, your test statistic. We get a p-value, which is about 4%. So we can reject the null hypothesis at 5%. Uh, could I reject at 1%? Could I reject my null hypothesis at 1%? No. The answer is no. So, I mean, you know, this is not an extremely conclusive test, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at 5%, yeah, we can say there does not appear to be any difference between the mean fuel economies uh, between these three different uh, populations of vehicles. But at 1%, we would be unable to reject the null hypothesis and would have to conclude uh, that it appears that maybe all the fuel economies, um, you know, are different, are, excuse me, are not different, all right, for these three different populations of vehicles. So not an extremely conclusive test, but 5%, is not really a ton, a tremendous amount of risk in committing a type one error. So, yeah, I would say, you know, you probably want to reject the null hypothesis. You could even reject it as low as 4% a level of significance. That's about as low as you could go uh, for the risk of committing a type one error is about 4% chance. That's not a very big chance. All right. Notice our, um, I want to show you some other values that are computed. Uh, this is your, MSB value, the, the mean squared error between treatment levels, or this is the variance, ladies and gentlemen, between treatment levels, which is the 121.359. You see it down there? See, we computed it right here. There it is on your calculator. Uh, numerator degrees of, uh, denominator degrees of freedom is nine. Let's scroll down. Now, the numerator degrees of freedom is two. Uh, this is your, uh, let me see something here. Fact it's numerator degrees of freedom. Okay. And uh, for our within variance, uh, which is 25.106, there it is. And uh, now where it says factor here, that's between treatment levels and error is within treatment levels. So underneath factor, we have two numerator degrees of freedom. That's K minus one, number of treatment levels minus one, three minus one is two. This is your SS, um, SSB, 242.7166. This is your uh, variance uh, between treatment levels. Then error is, this pertains to within, the amount of variation within each treatment level. How every, how every data point varies with one, other, one another within each respective treatment level. Denominator degrees of freedom is N minus uh, K, which is 12 minus three, which is nine. This is your SS um, E value and your MS E value mean square for error, 25.106. So you take your MSE value divided by MSB, you take, um, no, no, it's the other way around. You take MSB divided by MSE, and you get your test statistic, which is about 4.26, okay. And there you go. So that's analysis of variance on your calculator here. Here's another example in the following table, number of stories of 18 buildings in Chicago, Houston, and New York City. 
these are the number of stories of various buildings in these cities. Test a claim that there is a difference in the heights of the building in each in these cities at 5%. The hypothesis says essentially that the mean height of all these buildings in each of these cities are equivalent versus the, null, the alternative hypothesis says, says that no, they are not all equivalent. There's three treatment levels because there's three cities. One, two, three, four, five, six. Notice there's six observations in each of the three samples. This is a way of doing the problem manually. Of course, we need to have some statistics for each of these samples. The sample means and also the variances could be obtained by using a one var stats feature on your calculator. This is the grand mean. And then you use your formulas we used before. This is your variance between and your variance within the treatment levels. And notice you get 1209.15 versus 274.33. If you take this 1209.15 and divide it by 274.33, you get the test statistic, the F variance ratio. And what does that work out to give us? 4.41. All right. Now, how did they get this 3.68? Well, there's two numerator degrees of freedom and there's 15 denominator degrees of freedom. How did they get two numerator degrees of freedom? Well, there's three treatment levels. K is three. K minus one, and therefore is two. Denominator degrees of freedom is the total sample size, where you have um, 18 total observations, three treatment levels. So 18 minus three is 15 denominator degrees of freedom. We're testing at 5%. So you would have to take uh, to your appendix, alpha equals 5%, go get an F table with 5% level significance. And we have two denominator, two numerator degrees of freedom. Wait a minute, what do we got here? Numerator degrees of freedom is two and denominator degrees of freedom is 15. Okay. Numerator degrees of freedom is two. Denominator degrees of freedom is 15. So we got to scroll down to 15. That would be your F critical value right there, 3.68. So 3.68 is going to re, uh, separate the rejection from the do not reject a null hypothesis region, 3.68. And you can see that our test statistic, 4.41, is greater. Not by much, but it is greater than 3.68. Uh, therefore, it finds itself in the upper tail rejection region of the F probability distribution. Therefore, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And therefore, claim that um, it appears that these heights of these buildings from the three different cities, the mean height is not the same. So the mean heights of these buildings from these three different cities are not the same. That's what this hypothesis test of 5% is showing us here. Again, that does not look like an extremely conclusive test because that test statistic is not, not that much uh, higher or larger than your critical F value. So we would suspect our P value to be eh, small, but not extremely small, okay? And so if you were to use your calculator to do this test, again, you would um, use your ANOVA function. So you'd have to go to STAT, edit. Now you can just overwrite these values in the list here. You got 98, 54, 60. Uh, 
Uh, so we got what, 57? 83? 49? Now Houston, 53? 52? 45? 41, 36? And 34. Oh, you know what I forgot to do here? No big deal. Just hit your delete button until 53 becomes the top of the list. There we go. Wait. 53, 52, 45, 41, 36, 34. Then what's going on over here? What did I miss over here? What the... There we go. All right. Now we'll type in New York City. Eighty-five, sixty-seven, seventy-five, fifty-two, ninety-four. All right, we're ready for a Nova. Now, instead of scrolling all the way down, if you just hit your arrow key up once, you come to the bottom of the list, the Nova, immediately. All right, select the Nova, list one, two, and three. Make sure you separate these by commas. And away we go. So the test of statistic is about 4.41. P value is about 0.03, so we can definitely reject at 5%, but we could not reject at 1%, though. So, like I said, it's not an extremely conclusive test. But nonetheless, we will reject that 5% and conclude that there appears to be a difference between the mean heights of all the buildings in these various cities here. There's your ANOVA table and the ingredients that went into computing your test statistic F value. All right, any questions about this? All right. And that's it. Okay. So I'll just have you maybe do a couple of these problems here. I don't think we have to get into the manual way of doing these, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unless somebody, you know, wants to do it manually, you go ahead and do that. You know, we can, we can just use our calculator, use our ANOVA function. Uh, it's a little bit too tedious to do manually. All right, so let's wrap it up by looking at a couple problems in 11.7 and call it quits here. Here we go, one-way analysis of variance, 12.1. All right. Number seven, we'll call this classwork number one. Uh, you do not have to do this problem manually. Uh, you can just use your ANOVA function on your calculator. Following data shows the yearly budgets for leading business sectors in the United States at the 5% level of significance. Is there a significant difference in the mean budgets of the business sectors? The data are in thousands of dollars. And so there you go. Make sure you at least write down or indicate what hypotheses you are testing. We're testing at 5% and then make a decision 
and then a conclusion in plain English. We'll call this classwork one, number seven. Go ahead and do that. Do not do it manually uh, or using the critical value method. Uh, just use your ANOVA function on your calculator.
All right, so we load up our calculator here, list one, two, three, and four, respectively, with the beverage, electronics, food producers, and supportive services data. And now we conduct hypothesis, uh, the analysis of variance test here. So here we go. This calculator is saving us a ton of work. All right. Can anybody tell me what our test statistic is? What's our F variance ratio, our test statistic? One point ten. Yep. And what's our P value? Point three six seven. All right. Is that a large or small P value? Large. All right, it's a large p-value, and therefore, there's no way you can reject the null hypothesis. You'd have to increase alpha all the way up to 37% or higher before you could finally do so. But then you stand a whopping chance of committing a type 1 error. So these are the hypotheses we're testing here. Um, Uh, we were testing to see if the mean budgets uh, between these different business sectors are the same or are all the same or not the same. And uh, since we uh, cannot reject the null hypothesis, uh, we would conclude uh, that um, sample evidence does not suggest that there's any difference between the mean budgets of all uh, four of these different uh, business sectors here. So apparently it may be the case that these mean budgets are all equivalent to each other for the different sectors, okay? And that's what that test has told us here. All right. So conducting analysis of variance on, um, on the calculator is really not that big of a deal. Um, doing these problems manually, obviously, is a much more challenging uh, let's see let's see this this one looks interesting. Number eleven here, a researcher wishes to see if there's a difference in the mean number of hours people spent in traffic over a year in four selected large cities. This is the So these, this study was conducted for these cities, New York, San Francisco, Atlanta, Miami, to see if the mean number of hours spent by people in traffic in these cities over a yearly period is the same or not. Um, this is interesting investigation here. We can test at 10%. Is there a significant difference in the mean number of hours that people spent in traffic uh, for one year? Um, in these various cities here. So go ahead, call that classwork two, throw this data in your calculator and conduct analysis of variance on the means and see if these means are equivalent or not all the same. Let's see if the mean traffic time spent in these cities is the same or different. Interesting investigation. All right, go ahead and do that. Classwork number two.
All right, just a matter of loading up these lists here um, and how we conduct analysis of variance here. Notice your calculator would enable you to compare up to six different population means. There's six lists at our disposal. So that's pretty amazing for this machine. All right, so our test statistic is small or large. What's going on here? Oh, excuse me, our p-value, is it a small or large p-value? Very small. Uh, that's extremely small, which means we can reject at any level of significance and not even worry about committing a type 1 error. Therefore, this is an extremely conclusive test to uh, have us say that it does not appear that all the mean um, number of hours spent in traffic for a year uh, is the same for these different cities here. Okay, so apparently uh, in one or more of these cities, you spend more time waiting in traffic than in other cities. Um, now, we don't know which city, you know, has you spending more time in traffic uh, than other cities. This test is not designed to tell you that. It's just designed to tell us that there is a difference between the mean uh number of hours spent in traffic for these cities uh, are not all the same. That's all it's designed to tell us. Uh, anybody want to take a wild guess? So I honestly don't know. Um, I mean, if you had to guess, what uh, what city would you say you spend the most time waiting in traffic, if you had to guess? You know, if I my life depended upon it, I had to guess, I'd say New York City. Anybody beg to differ? In New York or San Francisco, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, that'd be my guess. I mean, I'd, I'd go with New York City. Um, San Francisco, I don't really know. I've never been out in San Francisco, so I don't know. I know Atlanta, I mean, uh, rush hour, just even driving through the city and on I-75 South to go to Florida, uh, they got like five or six lanes or something, and it is like gridlock around rush hour. I mean, that is a nightmare around this time of the year, especially Christmas. If you're going to Florida down there, you know, you just want to bypass the city and just stay on the expressway 75 South. But uh, I experienced where it was just like a, a huge parking lot because <laughs> we, we happened to be going through there at guess what rush hour when people got out of work. So that was a nightmare. I know Los Angeles traffic is pretty heavy too. Uh, my sister lives out there and she says it's around rush hour. It's a nightmare. You want to try to avoid rush hour, but I know New York City is really busy too, so I don't know. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so today we, to wrap up this course, we looked at um, non, uh, we looked at a parametric uh, test called analysis of variance for comparing uh, two or more, actually three or more population means for equivalence versus non-equivalence. And um, the function on our calculator enabled us to do that was the ANOVA function. And to do these problems manually is really an exuberant amount of time, whereby analysis of variance really should be conducted using a calculator or a statistical software package, in all honesty. And that's why I recommend you use your calculator in the ANOVA function. You're not going to have to do these problems manually, especially for Alex. They just want answers on Alex. So that's that. All right. So, um, that brings to a conclusion elementary statistics here at Mont. I hope you enjoyed the course and got something out of it. Uh, I enjoyed uh, teaching it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, wish you the very best in your educational goals. And I hope you have a safe and refreshing holiday. I'll stay on the line for a couple minutes if there's any questions or comments. Other than that, uh, please try to remember to get that exam done by uh, midnight, December 21st. And that's when your homework is due for chapter 11 and 12. Okay. Oh, um, stay tuned for the email. I will indicate specifically what uh, portion of your lecture notes I want you to send me. You know, you'll take a picture of it and send to me. 
as proof of having kept lecture notes throughout the entire semester. If you also have proof of having frequented the math uh, tutorial center on the main campus, you can take a picture of those of that proof and send it to me. Um, and all that's designed to give you a little extra credit on top of your overall course grade um, after all adjustments have been made. Of course, I'm, I'm, I am adhering strictly to the syllabus as far as replacing uh, low exam scores and low quiz scores. Um, I'm going to honor that according to the syllabus, right? All right. Uh, I have not done that, by the way, yet. I have not replaced any low exam scores or low quiz scores yet as I'm still waiting for some of these quizzes and exams to be completed on Alex so I can load them into Canvas. And then once I get all, all of them loaded and the deadline has passed, then I'm going to start replacing lowest quiz and exam scores with your highest ones. And then you'll be able to see your grade, exactly how it plays out. And of course, I'll add on one and or as much as 2% to your overall course grade, depending upon you know, if you can show me your lecture notes and or any proof of having frequented the Math uh, Tutorial Center. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, take care. It's been fun. Um, I will be on the line for a couple minutes if you have any other questions.